There's an old saying that says, we the few have done so much with so little for so long that we are now qualified to do anything with nothing. There is a theology, though, that is rampant in the American society today called the prosperity gospel. It's not new. It's been around for centuries. In fact, the reason why the disciples asked the question of Jesus that they asked when Jesus says it'll be harder for a rich person to go into the kingdom of God than a camel to pass through the eye of a needle, the disciples were astonished. Because even in their day, even before their day, it has been the attitude of people for centuries, even during the First Testament times. Why do you think everybody was so surprised when the difficulties befell dear Job, who was a very wealthy man? The human attitude has been for centuries, for many, many centuries, that if you're, if you're materially blessed, then you will have the favor of God or the gods or whatever divine being there is. That's been a predominant human attitude throughout the centuries. And so imagine the disciples, shall I even care, call it dismay? When Jesus says, it would be easier for a camel to pass through the eye of the needle. And of course, there's tons of stories about there's actually a place in the, in the gates called the eye of the needle that's supposed to be really hard to get into and blah, 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 blah. Uh, folks, give yourself a break. Don't make this more complicated than it is. Think of this just like Jesus means it. It's not possible for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. If you've ever tried to thread a needle, you know what I'm talking about. It's almost impossible for a piece of thread to go through the eye of a needle. <laughs> especially when you have my eyesight. And so imagine the dismay of the disciples when they heard it would be easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to get into the kingdom of heaven. And why is that? What is it about riches? What is it about plenty? Now, you, now you must understand, precious friends, those of you who are sitting there saying, well, Father, I, I don't qualify as being rich. I mean, you should see my bills I have to pay, blah, blah, blah. And that's, that's maybe wonderful and nice, but you must understand that every person sitting in this room today, compared to the vast majority of humans who have ever lived, are indescribably wealthy. You all qualify. So what's the holdup? What's the difficulty? Why does the Lord seem to suggest that it is the power of plenty to deaden the soul to spiritual things? Well, all we have to do to find the answer to that question is to watch the young man in our story today. I want you to look at him. He's a young man, and he does just the right things. When he comes up to the Lord, what does he do? What does the scripture say he does? He kneels. So he has hid his arrogance very well. He's hid his spiritual illness very well by outward, uh, outward appearances. And he kneels and he says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus does what he normally does. Jesus absolutely stands this on its head. He, sits, he puts the whole situation in a different light. He begins by saying to the young man, why do you call me good? Why do you call me good? Because you see, ladies and gentlemen, the first hint at the reason why plenty makes us blind to our spiritual poverty is because we use words we don't know what they actually mean. We don't appreciate what we're saying. Was Jesus trying to say he wasn't good? No. Was Jesus trying to say what he was saying was wrong? No. Jesus wanted this young man to be wakened from the slumber of his sleep so that he 
would begin to understand the danger his soul was in. Was his motivation wrong? Perhaps. Was his question bad? Not at all. In fact, I'm convinced that one of the things, in fact, tonight's radio program that we're doing tonight is going to be to answer the question, what must I do to be saved? But the problem that we have, brothers and sisters, is that we don't understand the meaning of the words we're using. We don't understand what it means to be saved. We don't understand what it means to be good. We don't understand what it means to even desire to be saved. And so Jesus wants this young man to deal with the heart of his difficulty. And so he begins by throwing him completely off bounds by saying, why do you call me good? I can imagine the young man saying to himself, you know, I thought the guy would have had a lot of other problems than me just calling him good. What in the world is that about? Why is he upset about that? But there again, Jesus wants this young man to wake up because if he doesn't wake up, he's never going to get what he says he wants. And he's never going to discover if what he says he wants is truly what he wants. Do you want to be perfect? Jesus says at the end, he says, if you want to be perfect, this is what you've got to do. First off, he tells them, you've got to follow the commandments. None of this is a secret, folks. If you want to enter the kingdom of God, none of this is a secret. There's no secret knowledge. There's no secret formula. There's no secret a path to follow. There's no four easy steps that only the few initiated really know to really tell them what is. No, folks. Everything that you need to enter into the kingdom of God has been told you over and over and over and over and over again. The real issue is what do you really desire? And that's why Jesus presses this young man, especially when the young man responds by saying, Oh, Lord, all these things I've done since my youth. I've never killed anybody. I can't tell you how many times I've had conversations with people that say that are so blind to their own spiritual poverty, beginning with myself. I can't tell you how many times I've had talks to people. Well, Father, you know, I'm not so bad. I mean, after all, I've never killed anybody. I mean, after all, I've never, I've never uh, cheated on my, uh, on my spouse. After all, I've never uh, uh, stolen anything. If you don't count that piece of candy that I got in the dime store the, when I was a kid. After all, I've never done this, that, and the other. And you start getting a litany of all the things they've never done. But I always wonder if I could ever get a list of the things that they have done. Because you see, ladies and gentlemen, at the very heart of the need to really wanting to find out if you really want to be saved, if you really want to enter the kingdom of God, isn't what you haven't done, but what you have done. It isn't what you've avoided doing in your life. I wish you could hear this this morning because this is so significant. It isn't what you have avoided doing in your life. It's, what you, it's how you've actually lived in your life, the proactive things that you've done in your life. And Jesus finally brings that point home when he asked the young man, if you really want to be perfect. Now here, folks, the word perfect here doesn't mean without flaw. It means grown up. It means mature. It means well-rounded. It means healthy. It means complete. If you really want to be grown up, if you really want to be healthy, if you really want to be complete, this is what you have to do. Sell everything you have. Give it away. Follow me. What does the scripture declare? The scripture says that the man went away sorrowful because he was a wealthy young man. This close to actually pressing into the kingdom of God. And he turned back. Now before you're too harsh on this young man, I confess to you there have been places in my own life where I've stepped close to real, real liberty, real spiritual maturity in my life, and I have seen what it costs and I've turned back. I confess to you there have been times, many times in my life when I've had that happen. Many times in my life, I have had that happen in my life where I've stepped right up to the place of true spiritual maturity in my life and I have counted the cost and said, this is too much for me right now. And I've turned back. I wonder if that's the case in your own heart as well. 
this morning. I want you to hear the words of our Lord Jesus. I want you to take them to heart. Because, brothers and sisters, this scripture is for you and me today. This scripture is for the abundantly blessed Americans who have a level of life that is unrivaled in the history of humanity. Who have a standard of living that is unrivaled in the history of humanity. Who have been blessed beyond measure. Is our plenty masking the poverty of our souls? Is our abundance intoxicating us into the stupor of our own spiritual illness? Are you and I willing to be roused from this slumber and move on to maturity and spiritual perfection? By abandoning the temporary priorities of a modern age that has lost its mind and has forgotten God. And decide to do what looks crazy to the world. And prioritize our spiritual life above everything else. Are there any courageous persons among us? that would step to that spot, that edge, and have the courage to leap. Not blindly, but into the wide open arms of a God who loves you more than you yourself know how to love. Today, would you be perfect? Perfect.